It's that time again. It's the Berkey and the Badger Board Game Battle Show. It's going to get wild. It's going to get wacky. It might even be a little insane. We're going to talk about board games and the board game industry. And you know, we might talk about anything else we want to talk about. Hey, 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 it's Berkey and Badger. And guess what? Berkey's back. Oh, makes me go, hmm, that's it. Hey, episode 48, pocket full of awards. We have an awesome, fun show. And Bert, a bit, a bit, a bit, Barry, I'm back. Yay! He's back from the doomsday machine called Kickstarter, and I've lost my buttons. <laughs> <laughs> and your marbles. Oh, yes, I lost them when you went away. Yeah, where are my marbles? I want my marbles, please. Please, my... may I have my marbles? <laughs> How are you doing, Mr. Kevin? Long time no Seasmeyer. Yes, I, I, I feel horrible, man. I just miss you. I, I so appreciate you taking over the show at the launch of our Kickstarter with Jamie Johnson. I did get a chance to listen to it, and it was a lot of fun. Uh, so really great job. But, yeah, it's like we're back in the saddle again, right? Yes, we are. We're ready to rock and roll. Woohoo! Woo big, 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 big fun. Well, I tell you, we're going to jump right into it. We're going to try to, we've got a ton of things that have, have been going on. Barry, what have you been up to since I talked to you last? Ooh, uh, well, I've been around the world. I, 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 and I can't find days? my baby. Yeah, uh, no. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, not much has happened. Um, at, a moment, of, but long story short, I've been pestering a, a guy that I used to work with in the vineyard uh, about starting a group with him because he was always talking about going out and gigging, and and he always turned me down for some reason. I don't know why. But anywho, he contacts me the other week and he says he wants to start a band with me, and so we've been banging our heads together, and we we we're starting a band, and we're recruiting a drummer at the moment. So yay! I'm doing some more music. Wow, hey, fantastic. A band. Yes. Uh, probably not your cup of tea because it's going to be a metal band and we're going to be doing stuff like Marilyn Manson. Oh. And, and well, I like metal. Audio. What are you talking about? <laughs> I can bang my head with the best of them. What are you talking about? Uh, I'm talking about rock <laughs> and metal. Yeah, probably. You'll probably get it. You'll probably like it. But we hey, shall I'm from see. The Carry on the wayward son. I'm there. I'm with you. I grew up in the 70s and 80s, man. Yeah, I, I grew up there as well. <laughs> <laughs> and, and the only other thing that's, uh, that's going on at the moment is I'm I'm preparing for Essen. I'm getting excited about Essen. So, um, yes. Yeah, it's just right around the corner, right? It's next week. This time next week, I will be there. So when do you leave? Monday? I leave on Tuesday. And then you drive, you drive to Essen or you train it? No, I'm training it. Um, all paid expenses, courtesy of Monolith, who I'm going to be working with. Uh, so you can find me at the Monolith booth demoing Batman, which is in Hall 6, uh, B116. And there oh, you fantastic. go. If you want to give me a manly hug, I'll be there. Just call my name and I'll be there. Yeah. It's uh, <laughs> I'll be there. So I guess uh, Brian Pope and some of the crew from Arcane Wonders, our sponsor, is actually going to be at Essen. Oh, right. So now, my, the end of our campaign is happening on the 25th, so I just there was no way for me to make it. But I'm starting to think that uh, Essen might be in my future down the road. Oh, that'd be cool. We get to see the sheriff wandering around Germany. You fit right in. A good sheriff. Yes, they probably they would, right? In in the, in the uh, kind of the beer halls of our uh, Germany, <laughs> yeah, some, some Heisenpfeffen and and Hassenpfeffer. We'll have some of that, and yes. we'll have some strudel and some sausages. And you'll be going back to your roots as well. Yes, that's exactly right. <laughs> I would love to go up there, and 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 I just want to go to Germany and eat for about four days. Oh dear. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think that's a good idea. <laughs> <laughs> oh, it's fantastic. So, well, I've been. 
Kickstarter man. How is yeah. things going? Well, thank you so much. Uh, the the Kickstarter's been flying. I mean, we got off to an amazing jackrabbit start. Uh, things just went right away, just going crazy. People embracing a lot of the groundwork that we laid, having our toppers at Gen Con and Dice Tower Con and, and a lot of quality uh, people in the hobby that that did reviews uh it the, the community just has embraced it fantastic and now we've just been on a steady rise we've been really gaining a lot of momentum couple things that have been really cool about game toppers and for those of you who don't know it's on kickstarter right now uh, we only have seven more days left we're in the final leg of this thing where you've hit $380,000. We're hoping that we can hit up to a half a million. That's what we're really hoping for. And so we're working really hard to do all that stuff. But we announced just this last week, the new Mycroft table. The Mycroft is a four foot by six foot beast. For all you Warhammer players, you epic guy, you know, gamers, you want the big dog, it's here. And that's been really warmly received. And we've also blown through like eight different stretch goals. All of the wow. game mats are unlocked. Uh, we're coming up with new innovations right now. Even as we speak, we've got this new really cool dice tower that Ben from Daedalus is working on. Uh, that's fantastic. Um, Havzi's dice are now available through the campaign from Gatekeeper Games. And we also have some amazing products from dogmite games with these component trays and the adventure case. I have one of them sitting right beside me right here. This is our new high definition poly uh, component trays. And this here is one of the trays that actually fits right inside of that. You probably can't see it real well here, but um, that's not one of them there. That's close. That's one of the component trays. And then this here is actually one of the trays that Hold your poker chips, your components, and those kind of things. And so long and short of it, uh, we're super excited. We're working crazy hours. So it's uh, a million things going on, but it's, 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 it's fantastic. It's energizing. It's euphoric. It's exhausting. It's crazy. And I don't even know what else to say about it, but it's really fantastic. Uh, the people that have just embraced this and all the people that have helped me, I cannot thank you enough. Uh, that's My heart is so full of gratitude for everyone's help. Uh, I, it really, it sounds cliche because you, you people say this, but I literally could not have done it without all the help. My daughter has done all the graphics work and she's worked 60 some hours on it. You know, I'm working 16 hour days and I've had such amazing friends and I, I hate to call people out because I'll, I'll miss somebody. Uh, but just the partnerships with Ben from Daedalus, Dogmite, uh, have these dice. There's, there's all kinds of other people who have done reviews of our toppers. You can see all of them on Kickstarter. You can see a lot of them. The Secret Cabal did, did one. Uh, Joel Eddy, uh, Scott Morris from Crits Happen, uh, Chaz Marler, Paradise Paradise. Uh, we have a, a G Club did it. Uh, also a board game closet. Uh, Brent, Trent Howell from the board game family. I feel like I'm missing somebody. Uh, Dan Me. King, the Game Boy Geek. <laughs> uh, Barry has done an invisible video. It's like this, this uh, what do you call those things where, where, you know, like the emperor had no clothes on? You're doing a video with our topper and he has no clothes on. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, something like that. <laughs> uh, whatever. <laughs> you can use your imagination on the podcast. That's the great thing about it. <laughs> <laughs> well, anyway, enough about all that. It's just fantastic. If you guys, anybody that's listening, you want to help us with this campaign, even if it's not in, in what you need, maybe you have a dedicated game table and you're not looking for this portable solution, even though I know a lot of people are, they have dedicated tables, they're still getting one of these because it's so great for game night. But if, if, if it's not in the ballpark for you, if you could help us share the word about it, there's just seven days left and we sure would appreciate it. So with that, that's, we're on to our next segment. We're going to talk about uh, things the last that make week's show. <laughs> oh, yeah. You've got to talk about the poll. That's right. You put yes. up a poll on the guild. Tell us, yes, Daddy, if, about the poll. If you remember our last show, uh, Jamie and I were talking about companies 
are they really just printing money? And um, I put a poll up on our Board Game Geek Forum, 2248, um, asking, how would you milk the customers if you were in charge of a board game company? Now, we had not many responses, but we had a few. Um, there were a couple, 50% of the votes actually said no, they would never do it. They'd want to produce a new and different game each time, which is really nice, I think. Right. 25% uh, of our votes said that yes, they would make collectible games with separate add-ons. So kind of your X-Wings and your, your Descents and things like that. And okay. another 25% said yes, they would just put out special anniversary editions. So you know, kind of like your ticket to ride ten year anniversary, which I think is nice as well. I think that's that I think that's the one I voted for. <laughs> I can't remember. <laughs> yeah, I think I, I'd put out special edition anniversary editions. But um yeah. What would what what did you vote for, Berkey? Uh I didn't vote, did I? Did I oh, vote? You were no. too busy, weren't you? I, I, I really was to be honest. <laughs> My bandwidth is so limited right now. Yeah. And that, that, I'm not talking about my internet. I'm talking about my old man head. <laughs> <laughs> oh, okay, yeah. so li listen no, at the end of the show. We'll put up another poll on, to, on this subject for this podcast. So uh, listen out for that and look out for that. Board Game Geek 2248. That's our guild, the Berkey and Badger Board Game Babble. Sounds great. Well, we're going to move right on to our sponsor. We have Arcane Wonders is now uh, producing the new, or has designed the new game, Ruby. Cue music. Are you playing it? Um, I haven't recorded it off onto CD. Oh, no. Oh, no. Well, I will, just, just, I will do the ad here then. Well, basically what Ruby is is from the, the very famous anime series by Rooster Teeth Productions. And they've produced some other games, but they have hired Brian Pope and his uh, company Arcane Wonders to be the design studio for this particular game. This is a card-driven combat game game uh, you're gonna see a lot about it it's on Kickstarter right now uh, Ruby combat you're gonna see the graphic right there it's on Kickstarter right now it is blowing through stretch goals miniatures has been unlocked I think it's raised over four hundred thousand dollars it's some really great tactical card art you can see the card art here is fantastic beautiful Beautiful stuff goes, and there's a lot of back and forth card play. Well, knowing uh, uh, the inside scoop on this one, this was in development. Brian Pope, his son Benjamin, man, these guys pulled out all the stops. They were working round the clock designing this game, so it would not be just a product. It would be a real high end game, and so Rooster Teeth. Uh, put their trust in them to do this, and and knowing Brian and what has happened there, this here is going to be really something pretty exciting. You see, Barry has the screen there. There's a how to play video. As I understand it, Rooster Teeth has like nine million fans of their Good. show, so oh. this is a huge, huge audience. Mm. And again, we're just very thankful for uh, Arcane Wonders sponsoring Berkey and Badger. They make such other great Dice Tower essential games like uh, Viral, which is just going great. People are raving about Viral. You can get Sensei's Path expansion for Onitama. Of course, the Sheriff of Nottingham just released their big expansion, The Merry Men. And you can find these now in your retail outlets. So... Uh, go ahead and check out Arcane Wonders and some of their great titles. And Spoils of War, flying off the shelves. Go ahead and grab that one, too. Yes. With so we're going to move on to our next segment, Things That Make You Go Hmm. Things That Make Us Go Hmm. Board Game News. Berkey and Badger reflect on the current events that are happening in the board game industry. Some may be good. Some may be bad, but they're all things that make us go, hmm. 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 
Oh yeah. Oh yeah. A smooth fade, like a smooth criminal. Like a smooth <laughs> cup of tea sliding down the back of my throat. <sighs> Uh, Barry, one of the things that is making me go, hmm, had to do with Kickstarter. Well, obviously, I've I've been very uh, involved with Kickstarter lately. I've been a, a backer. I'm not a super backer. I haven't backed just hundreds of projects a year like some folks do. Yeah, um, you got your badge. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, I don't even know what it what 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 qualifies you for being a super backer. I typically will back six to ten projects in a year maybe not that much six, mm. uh, at least six i think a um, cape helps a cape yeah and then glasses as well so you can disguise yourself i am super backer <laughs> da, 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 da. loads of money no. yeah no i haven't done super backing so one thing that was on kickstarter was a kickstarter project from druid city games called guardians call now, the, the thing that makes me go, hmm, is a couple things. Uh, first okay. off, uh, uh, Druid City Games has made some very, very interesting games. They made Grim Forest, the Barnyard Roundup, I think it was called. Uh, the art assets from Druid City, I think, are really amazing. Uh, I think they're just fantastic. But this new game, Guardian's Call, was touted to be a little bit of a bluffing social interaction aspect to it that is much like Sheriff of Nottingham. Okay. Well, that caught my attention. I thought, yeah, I like that. And then I saw the artwork and I went, oh, yeah, this is awesome. Uh, it was pretty affordably priced, and so I actually backed it. Okay. The thing that made me go, hmm, is that the campaign was only 11 days. Ooh, that is short. <clears throat> Excuse me. I have, I've, I've listened to a lot of different people regarding Kickstarter. I've become a student in the last year and a half or so, knowing that I was going to be taking Game Toppers to market, and I'm uh, so appreciative of Ga Jamie Stegmeyer and all the things I've learned from him. Uh, also, Richard Bliss on funding the dream, and other notable people in the hobby that have, you know, I've been able to glean information, and I've, I've heard a little bit about this, but. It really made me go, hmm, because here, this game looks really great, but it it seems to me that there, it sh, you know it funded at thirty seven thousand dollars, which wasn't like a, a huge amount, but it was successful. Seven hundred and forty nine backers. Mm -hmm. um, but I wonder if it would have went the normal twenty five to thirty five days um, as a Kickstarter creator. Now myself, thirty five days is kind of brutal. Yeah, I mean you're you are constant. You can't get away from it. And you know I've made a really strong responsibility to answer every question the best that I could, and and to make sure I didn't miss anyone. I'm sure I may have, but nonetheless, it it's incredibly uh, involved, and and so you're never away from it. So I can understand why people would maybe go to a shorter project. But on the other hand, it doesn't give as many people time to hear about the project. Mm -hmm. Unless I don't you've know done what you the think about beforehand. that. Yeah. Yeah, I've, I've seen projects which have been like 20 or 15 days, um, and they've done really well because they, they, they've done the roll up before the, they actually launched on Kickstarter, and it, you know, it just went exploded. Everyone that wanted it backed it, so there was no like drop off point. It was like a constant back, 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 and then it finished. Which I think is, is another kind of good strategy plan. You you know, it's a hard punching. Bam! Here you go. Here's the project. Back it now, and oh, it's finished. Ben Ben uh, Steelers joined us in the chat, and he's he's uh, he said he's um, he believes that over a hundred games at twenty per game is a super backer level. And he says, you've been much more involved and responsive than most projects I have participated in. Uh, thanks, Ben. I sure appreciate it. No, I, I have, my, my personal paradigm is I really have a commitment to each person. They're not a backer number to me. They're, they're, they're my customers, they're my friends, and I wanna really do well by them. So, and I realized I've, I've been a part of other projects where the communication has been really poor. And yeah. so I've tried to not overdo updates, but 
be informative. And we've done several live events. We're doing another one this coming Thursday uh, as well. But um, I'm kind of of the opinion that when you're doing your marketing, even though you have these dog days of your Kickstarter where things kind of lull out, Mm -hmm. um, it's pretty normal. And that's a little grueling emotionally, to be honest. I mean, it's just like, oh, what's happening? And, and then I've l learned from others, don't worry, just keep doing what you're doing. Just yeah. keep doing what you're doing. And so you keep working hard. You keep pushing. You treat, keep trying to get people's eyes on the project so they can make an informed decision. And then at the end, it all pays off. And you've noticed Kickstarters the last week. It's always about the first week and the last week. That's exactly right. But now with this 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 Kickstarter, we didn't have that opportunity to you just had to kind of blitz it real quick. And I wonder if it would have been a longer project. It's it looked great. It really looked great. And I would have thought it would have had higher backing than that. Or that that's just what made me go hmm. Yeah, but they'll probably do a second print and and it'll go bang again, you know. Um it's just a different strategy and i think you know that that's the way the the world i think it's like your project is what 35 days you've had this great start and then it's just this stagnant like maybe nobody backing for three or four days and then you get a couple of backers and then it might drop out whereas they just want the constant you know backers every day because they, they've generated the interest. They don't have a lot of information to punch out to the audience all the time. They have little bits. So they thought, well, let's just condense it. And then we can do like a, a posting every day and uh, keep our audience occupied that way. It's like um, uh, Mythic Battles and Joan of Arc. They're, they're always posting something every day to keep you tempted, even though they're not reaching stretch goals and putting like stretch goal information up. They're posting something in there. They're, they're opening a new add-on that you can add so it, it's it has become like this real kind of like pattern play of how to be a successful kickstarter which i think yeah. is you know it again your your kind of your product doesn't kind of fit into the same kind of group as a board game because the right. stretch goals are, you know they can add an extra character or they can add an extra card whereas you you can't add an extra leg to your table um, <laughs> oh, we could, but <laughs> get one free leg. <laughs> yeah, if we ever, if we actually offered legs for our toppers. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's what's making me go. Hmm. How about you, Barry? The thing, one of the things that made me go home is when we ever do the things that make us go home, we always talk about Kickstarters, which is kind of strange. Yeah, it is. <laughs> and maybe it's just the way of the board game industry. Um, but um, anywho, the main thing that made me go home is the impressive five million that was raised on Kickstarter for the game The Seventh Continent. I am, oh, wow. I am, yeah amazed this is a really great game i've just i've not long ago done two video reviews of this game because i love it so much this is this is the only second game that i've given a 10 out of 10 for because it is just so amazing and i am you know not only just proud to be part of the seventh continent um i just love playing it i am so addicted to this game and um it's it, it's a, amazing that you know and uh, you know it's great that a great game does get its praise and it does get, you know, that kind of financial support, which I think it is amazing. And now on this current campaign, the, it's the expansion, but you can also get in on the first edition of the product as well, right? Yeah, basically, because the first edition, there was only like uh, 12,000 backers, but now you're looking at over 30,000 backers. Um, and a lot of them are veterans who have been to the seventh continent and they just want the expansion, but there's lots of people that want the base game as well because Tom's reviewed it and everyone's gone, woo, and uh, Raudo's reviewed it and everyone's gone, woo, must have this game. But yeah, there's some still some skeptics out there who's like, nah, nah. You can't yeah, I just, saw, I just saw uh, crits happen. Uh, Scott Morris did it. He actually did a photo of, of seventh continent on a game topper. And uh, he's just loving that game. Yeah, it's it's an amazing adventure. Um, it's uh, it is a game book, 
but it's on the table and it's different every time you play it. Seriously, it is different. I've played the same curse. I've started in the same place four times and every time it's different, even though I have to do certain things in an order. But um, it's a learning experience. It's it's ties in with the theme that you've already explored the continent and you've magically just appeared back, um, which I think is great because you're using your memory of where did you go last time? Did you touch that thing? Did you put your hand in that hole over there and, and live or not? You can't remember. <laughs> but um, yeah, uh, kudos to Sirius Pulp for bringing out a fantastic project and it's been very, very successful. And it's probably going to be the last time that we see the seventh continent on Kickstarter before they move on to a new game, which will it, probably have the, the same mechanics but a different theme. Is the game actually available in retail at all? It won't be available in retail at all. It's Kickstarter only due to the fact that the, to produce all those cards, um, you may not think cards are uh, that expensive, but they're, they're, they're all different. Um, so there's a lot, a lot of, of, lot of art. art. Yeah, there's a lot of art as well. And then with there's the writing and then how it works in and everything so yes that's Kickstarter. and it's got this fantastic soundtrack <laughs> yeah i totally forgot about that <laughs> <laughs> done by yours truly yeah you did a great job on it and i i hope you that they will to continue to hire. yeah i heard a lot of the clips on it from your uh cd baby link or whatever that you had where you can oh. listen to the 30 second uh blips of it it's only 30 seconds. Oh, stinky so. buggers. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, it sounded really great. In fact, I think you sent me a, you sent me another link of one of the whole tracks. Is it like nine minutes or? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah good stuff. Good stuff. Yeah, so that's well, what's been making me go, hmm. Well, let's move right on to our next segment then. We'll keep this show moving. Yeah. We're going to go to the good, the not so bad, and the ugly. Boom, ba boom. Yep. <laughs> There you see our memes. Well done, Barry. We've got, oh boy, <laughs> the tracks are running today. The tracks are running. Um, tracks I, of my tears. I've forgotten how to run this thing. I tell you. <laughs> I missed you. <laughs> well, we have our normal memes. Again, the good, the not so bad, and the ugly is a first impression segment. These are not full-blown reviews. We're going to give you our first thoughts. Some of these times we've played the game several times, sometimes just a little bit, and we're going to give you our honest first impressions, and we're going to rate it, whether we think it's good, not so bad, or if it's ugly. So our first meme there for the good is... You can a very big that. Oscar being carried on someone's shoulder. Oh, that's a huge Oscar. Yeah, because we're talking about awards in our Babel subject. It's a huge reward. It's the hugest, hugest, most <laughs> hugest Oscar that is ever... It's the most luxurious. It's gold, you know what I mean? It's luxurious, of course. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> With no caption, it's just a big Oscar on someone's shoulder. For the not so bad, we have uh, what looks like probably La La Land that has won, and look, all these Oscars have been held up. There's and they have something to say. My Oscar has a first name. It's Spiel Origins. <laughs> Toy Star. Golden Geek. Uh, Bob. Bob. <laughs> was that the Berkey or Badger Show? Award? Yeah, Berkey or Badger Award. Yeah. If you get the Berkey or Badger Award, you're in like Flynn, baby. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right. Uh, <laughs> so, what what have you been playing there, B -b 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 Barry? And our ugly me. Oh, Oh, the ugly. Yeah, of course. We got Clint Eastwood holding up two Oscars in his fists. And mm -hmm. what does he say? He's saying, 
Don't call me ugly, punk. <laughs> you try your Clint. Come on. Don't don't call me ugly, punk. <laughs> Make my day. Mm. Ah, that sucked. Make my sandwich. Make my sandwich. Make my podcast. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Okay, so what you been playing, my friend? Okay, I'll start by finding it on Board Game Geek so I can remind myself what it looks like. Okay. Yes. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna start explaining this game. I'm not gonna go I'm not gonna tell you what the title is. Let's see if you guys can guess. Let's see yes. if you can guess what game I'm talking about. And then try and guess whether I think it's good, bad, or ugly. Okay. In this game, it's set in the future, kind of like a, a Blade Runner-ish future. Um, and Ooh. the main mechanic for the game is an auction mechanism. And you have chips, but you're not spending the chips to, uh, to bid on these things that you want. These things are going to be people, and they're going to be modules. And you're going to want to collect these because they have special powers that interact with each other. You'll be able to get a module and put up to two people on board that module, and all their powers will interact with the other characters, which will give you points, which may give you some other kind of resources that you can use. And as I said, this is, the main mechanic is a auction style. And what will happen is you'll have this big board laid out with lots of different things that you can bid on, and you will have these roads which connect them up. And you'll be placing your chip in between two or maybe three of these things that you want. And that will allow you to put some bids on those items. And of course, on the other side of that card, there's a route where other persons can, other people can bid. So this whole bidding mechanic is a very clever, thinky system of where you're gonna put your chips and where you're gonna put your bids with those chips. And then obviously after you've won those, you'll be connecting them up and paying resource money to, to to, to equip them and place them in front of you to get your points, to get you other resources, which you can use to do other things. So uh, this goes on for about four rounds. And after four rounds, player with the most points uh, is the winner. Wow. I think I saw you post something on this, but I can't remember the name because I didn't really pay attention. <laughs> oh, yes. Wow. Of course I posted something. That's what I do. Oh, yes, yes, yes. I've been so delinquent on, on listening to almost all media and stuff lately. I've just been too busy, but mm. um, gosh. Well, let's just say Ben has just said sentinel, and that is wrong. Sentient. 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 Oh, I can't read. Yeah. I need glasses. <sighs> he said. So it's not sentient. That's from, from uh, yeah. Renegade Game Studios. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I don't know. I, okay. I'm, I'm at a blank, so go ahead and tell us what it is. Okay, the game is called Cedars uh, from Series Exodus, which is a brand new game oh. which has just come out this year. Um, uh, as I said, it's a sci-fi game with some, excuse me, with some really crazy kind of sci-fi dark cyberpunk art. Um with a bidding mechanic and resources and bits and bobs that go with it. Do I think that this game is a good game, a bad game, or an ugly game? Well, generally, I, you know, I've, I, I know sometimes you're not a fan if a game is, is crowd dependent. And so sometimes that will give you a negative impression if you don't have a good crowd. And bidding games sometimes can be crowd dependent. Mm -hmm. So for that reason, I, this actually sounds really good to me, but I'm going to say not so bad because of that. You know what? You are... It's a tough one, but you are right. It's not so bad. It is... Um, a, it has a... The, the, the auction mechanic is fantastic. It's a great idea. Um, even when you kind of like lose a lot of bids, what happens is these chips have their own individual symbols on them and their own individual colors. And what will happen is that chip will go back into your hand at the end of the round and it, because it didn't win a bid, but it'll, the value of it will go up. So you'll be able to put more bids on next time you use it. So there's a nice kind of like balancing mechanism of, you know, hmm. um, 
you, your chips are worth more and more if they don't win. And again, it's choose after you've won the bid, you take the card back and you have to take a chip back from either side. So if you've got a chip either side of it, you can choose which one of those chips comes back. So it's a strategy in the fact that you could say, well, I'm going to leave that chip there because it's already worth the value of four. I'll make it worth a value of five for the next round. Yeah. Um, the whole, the auction mechanic is fantastic. But yeah, that sounds really good. The the bit that it kind of makes me go, ma, is the, the cards themselves. There are like 120, 150 different cards, which is a Ooh. bit of a mouthful to remember because they're all different factions and they're all different colors and each of them would do different things. So like the yellows are, I think, are the judges and each judge does a different thing. One can put a, another person's card into prison. Another one can take a, a prisoner out of someone's prison and put it into your hand. Um, and that's just one color. Then you've got the other six, the five, other five colors. There is too many cards to to think about and after the first play i was like yeah this is great but it's just too much you really need to know every single card before you go into it you know imagine like seven wonders when you're drafting cards first time you play you don't know what any card does and how it interacts with others but after your mm -hmm. fourth or fifth time you, you it's, it's simple this is like seven wonders but harder <laughs> wow um, so, yeah, I can see where the complexity kind of ramps up because of just the the so much to remember. Yeah, so um, it's not bad. I, I would play it again. Um, obviously, I'll probably have to play it about another four or five times before you start to get to grips with all the different cards and how they work with each other. But um, really, really quite good. Very, very beautiful to look at. And as I said, it's got some fantastic components. These chips sit in the player board and oh, it just looks great. Do you feel nice. like if you play it play it more often that your rating might go up on it because yes. you become more familiar with the game? Yes, uh, that that's a problem. That is one problem with the game. Someone that's experienced at the game will probably lap someone on the score uh, track score track about by a hundred and fifty points, from what I've heard as well. So, um, <laughs> so experience is a game for this one. Yeah, sorry. Experience pays a key part in this game. The more you've played it, the better the game is and the more you enjoy it. So, um, and the better you'll be at it. Sure. So that was Cedars um, from the series Exodus. What have you been playing in Berkey? Well, I have a game that is has territorial control. Mm -hmm. It also has worker placement. Mm -hmm. uh, I would consider this a big box game. Um, let me give you. A, I would say that you are you are collecting resources in this game because you want to be able to do things that will help you with the area control mechanism. Right. Um, Without giving away too much, I, I could give you some clues and you'd know exactly what it is. So um, at the moment I'm thinking scythe, but I believe you've played scythe before. We have. We have. Right, so it's ben not has a guest. I'm not looking at the chat, so I don't know. I'm not cheating. Okay. Well, uh, Ben gives a clue of thugs on a map. Oh, it's not the Godfather, is it? And and he is correct. That is correct, you know? When did I make an offer that, you know, when did I ever refuse an accommodation? Yes. You know, you come to me on the day of my daughter's wedding. It's a shotgun <laughs> wedding. It's, it's the godfather, Corleone's, Corleone's. Uh, okay. Is it like Eric Lang game? Mini or not. It's a, it's a big box Eric Lang game. Look at, oh. Marlon Brando, the art is fantastic. Basically, you've got all these different turfs that are in the game, and you're trying to be the boss of these turfs. And you can shake down the front of a business or the shake down the back of a business. Your family member can go out in the in on some of these border uh, of the turfs and get extra to shake down the back of all these different businesses to get extra resources these resources let you do jobs like uh, maybe you can make a car bomb and blow up everybody in the one thing that's a mean <laughs> one then they then they go sleep with the fishes in the hudson 
<laughs> you know, Luca Brazzi sleeps with the fishes. Okay. <laughs> Are so, you a Godfather guy? I'm not a Godfather guy at all. Do you know? You don't have you watched the movies? No. Never. Oh, dude, you got to watch it. These are the best. I mean, this is the the Godfather is is one of my favorite shows uh, as far as drama goes. Uh, it's just brilliantly done. I like all three of them. I know some people don't care for the third. Nonetheless, you don't have to like these particular uh, movies to to enjoy the game. So I'll yeah. say all of that. Okay. With that, um, you can probably guess what my thoughts are on the game, but yeah. tell me what you think. I think. Uh, well, at the moment, I'm thinking maybe I should upgrade from Bugsy Malone. Uh, I've only just recently watched Bugsy Malone in French, which is quite funny because they talk in French and then they sing in English. It's strange. But anyway, <laughs> um, I think that you think this game is great. <laughs> yeah, it's it, it's it's off the charts good. I yeah, so. it's yeah. definitely. <laughs> Love it. I just love it. I, I like your Lang's designs. I, Blood Rage is my favorite game. Uh, I feel like this game might go into my top 10. I've played this probably, I think, four times now, maybe five times. I had the opportunity to demo it at the Cool Mini or Not Expo in March. I got to play the first round demo on the Dice Tower with Tom Vassell, Eric Lang, Richard Launius, and uh, Derek Porter. And uh, I loved it. Yeah, I loved it then, and I I love it more every time I play it. It's just it's just great. Uh, the 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 way the mechanism. There's a little bit of take that, but it's kind of universal. Take that. Everybody is is vying for. Well, should I grab one of these jobs that is available to all of us, or do I go to a business to shake down a job to get a choice of two jobs? And hopefully I have the resources to do that. So there's this, this tension of going back and forth and I got to make sure I take that one, but am I going to get knocked off? So I don't want to take it too early. And there's this back and forth that everybody is doing. So it doesn't feel like, you know, everybody's picking on one person. And I like that. I don't like games that you feel ganged up on. Um, but, but this is area territorial control. So if you're not a big fan of territory control games, there's a slight element, but I, we had one guy in our game group that played this last time. He does not like territory control at all. He, he doesn't like it. And he played this and thought it was pretty good. So the art assets, the, the miniatures, everything about the game is produced at a high notch. Uh, congratulations to Cool Mini or Not, Eric Lang. I will look out for that, Essen, then. <laughs> Jesse Shakey's in the house. Yeah. He, he said he wasn't excited about the game, but he played it with me and friends at Gen Con and really had a great time with the game. I remember that. We played that with the uh, designer Dustin from Sigil, the new game that's going to be coming out. And uh, we had a blast doing that. Yeah, that was a great game. Okay. So have we got time to quickly do another one or do you want to skip straight to the back? Yeah. We've only got like about 30 I, I, minutes left. Yeah, let's do let's do uh, let's do one each real quick. Okay, no worries. All right, this game should be easy for you to guess. This game has spaceships and aliens and planets, and people will be chatting to each other, trying to um, place their spaceships on other people's planets. Ah, Star Trek Ascendancy. No. <laughs> oh no! Oh no! Oh no! Each player has a race that has a special power, which lets them break the rules. A special race. Come on. Uh, Twilight easy. Imperium? No. Cosmic Encounter. Yeah, that's the baby. Yes. <laughs> okay. Yes, I've managed to get Cosmic Encounter off my shelf after two and a half years and actually play oh, the boy. damn thing for <laughs> once. <laughs> <laughs> oh, dear me, that was a challenge. Uh, yes, I have the French version, um, so I've had to translate all the cards. Well, all the cards, obviously. How, how many did you play with? We played a three-player game, which may pay, like, 
a bit of information for you for my my result what i thought about oh yes i would not consider three players ideal at all in fact i think you need to play five or six um four is okay but three you're not going to get the experience that you want with the negotiation going to the different planets uh the player abilities um it's not ideal at all mm. in my opinion mm. so if you if you had a negative feeling of game i'm gonna i'm gonna uh, well obviously i know you know it's credentials uh, i i doubt that you would call it ugly even though you had a maybe it wasn't a great play for you but um i'll, I'll say not so bad as your rating yeah, you'd be right. It is not so bad. Um, it did feel a bit flat. One of the players was not very talkative and not very negotiative. Uh, one of the players was, you know, just like me, a copy of me. And we were having a good old laugh. Um, another kind of like negative, if you've never played the game before, is again, it's the same as Cedars. If you don't know what the powers are, you can't kind of guess what other players' powers are if they don't reveal them. Um, we, we were laughing and joking that one player was losing all their ships and they had all their ships in the warp because they lost like almost every kind of conflict, conflict, but yeah. that was their objective. That was their race. Their race was to have no ships left to win the game instantly. And not knowing that it was a kind of like a, it was kind of like a shock, but at the same time, if I'd have known that it would have been, you know, yeah. That's yeah. With it. three that's players, you just don't. You just don't get the interaction you need when you have four and five and six, especially five people, I think is a sweet spot. Boy, you get everybody, their negotiations form, the alliances form. Well, and at that point, people start using their abilities. So we start to know it. And then who has the, you know, what's what's the card called that uh, kind of is the double benefit card, uh, the flare, flare card. Flare cards. Uh, uh, yeah, the flare of your race. Uh, gives you that extra ability and so who has that and how are we going to trick them and and all that negotiation fun side of the game comes into place so yeah yeah I, I i think that's one of the problems with this is segments meant to be kind of fun give people information but it's not thorough thoughtful reviews you know barry does amazing thorough thoughtful reviews he'll play a game you know 10 times to make sure he's five times minimum just to and different player counts so he does a real thoughtful job and and when we do this we don't always have that opportunity but no. I, I think we've done a good job of explaining that here uh i was playing a game that is actually a trick-taking game i've never seen a trick-taking game that was designed solely for two people uh, I was really the art in it is kind of interesting. There's player, there's there's different card abilities within your hands, and get this, only three suits. <laughs> Normally, in a trick taking game, you're expecting four suits, right? Each uh -huh. each player is dealt thirteen cards, and uh, you're going to play to twenty one. Whoever gets twenty one or higher. And it's generally played over, probably take you three to four rounds to play it. You play it in 30 minutes. Uh, it's from a, a game studio right now that is knocking it out of the park. Right. Because um, when you said three suits, I thought, yeah, that's that's Dwarf King. Because that's three nope. suits. Oh, but, that's a good um, point. But that, it, that plays up to about five or six players. One suit is keys, one suit is bells, and the other suit is something else. Aries. Aries. It's uh, uh it's <laughs> cherries, bells, and sevens. No, it's dang it. I knew what it was too, and then I just drew a blank. Uh, <laughs> is uh, anyone on the chat guess? Oh, it? moons, moons. Ah, okay. Never moons. heard of it. So here's a here's the key card. Here's the moon card. Bell's card. This here is one of the player cards, a special ability, the nine. Okay. So the game's called Moons? Nope. The game is called Fox in the Forest by Renegade Game Studios. Oh. Interesting. And this I played this with my daughter Gabrielle. I've been wanting to play it. I I, I ordered it a while back uh, when it became available, 
and it's been sitting on myself a shame for a long time, and I, I just haven't had any time to play any games. And Gabby was home, and I said, let's do something. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> and so we we did. Sorry about that. We uh, we played the game. We, we watched a quick little video from Dan King, the Game Boy Geek. I always like to put on a video and then skim through the rules quick. That's my method of learning. <laughs> Um, and anyway, we did that, and we were playing right away. It was simple. Uh, once you got the player abilities and you got to see that you could go back and forth with these a little bit, it took me a little bit to get some strategy on it. I don't even know if I still have. What do you think I think? Well, Two-player game, trick-taking. You like trick-takings. You're, you're a very, very um, legendary Mike Fitzgerald fan. Um, cool. I'm going to say that you think this is good. Yeah, I'm gonna say good. I've, I've, uh, yeah, yay! I've only played it once. Okay, guys. So I can already see though that I want to play this many more times. I want to play this with my wife. We're going out to Colorado in November to help at the Haunted Game Cafe with Mark Street, Chaz Marler, the heavy cardboard people, a bunch of other people to raise money for extra life. I'm actually taking a couple game toppers out to the Haunted Game Cafe. Ooh. We're going to actually hook up with Mike Fitzgerald on the back end of the trip coming home in Denver. And so we're going out there for a few days. Um, this is a perfect type of game to travel to do that with because we can play it in 30 minutes. There's lots of choices. It really makes you think. I've, I've never encountered a two-player trick-taking game that did this. Mm -hmm. um, I, I, I'm really intrigued by it. Um, I, Gabby beat me. She cleaned my clock. You know, she so was like 20, 23 to 16. Uh, just, yeah. But I want to play it again. Yeah. So, Revenge. So there you go. <laughs> so so in, in light of having a shorter show today, we're going to have to cut this to an hour and a half show. We're going to leave at 11.30. We're going to move right on into... Babble. I am so... Oh, Barry. And now it's time for the Babble. Babble, 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 and Badger's Board Game Babble. Ah, uh, why would you ever give these two monkeys a podcast? Precisely. Anyway. You never know. Let's put on my best. <laughs> here we are in the Babylon Square again, listening to the chatter of our friends that live here. Oh, yes, I sound like a sports commentator. <laughs> uh, some are extremely happy, others are not. Mainly not. Why? Wow, with Essen just around the corner, the Essen Awards are probably the most prestigious award in the board gaming world that we have. But do they make an influence and an impact on us as customers buying games? If not, what are awards for? And who is the best award? And why are awards important? Hmm. Good question, huh? Hmm. Yeah, great question. I'm glad you asked it. Well, Awards, you know, we, we did the one meme there uh, on the, the good, I think it was the meme, right? That we have a lot of awards in the gaming hobby. Uh, we have the Spiel Awards, which is broken into three different categories. The Spiel de Jaris, which I think is probably recognized as, as probably one of the premier. It's definitely, in my opinion, the most coveted award that is in gaming because if you get the spiel award you're going to sell a quarter of a million copies of your game mm -hmm. see that you know exactly. ticket ticket to ride blah 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 yeah so spiel is very important this year's winner of the spiel de jaris was king domino mm -hmm. well that that's a bruno catala game uh blue orange games right yeah uh, it's a fantastic game. I actually got to do an interview with Bruno at Gen Con, and we talked about the new game coming with it uh, called Queen, Queen Domino. Domino. And he, there's a, if you go to Board Game Theater on Facebook, you'll actually see an interview. You probably have to scale back or scroll back a ways, but you'll see this interview with Bruno talking about that. Um, Domino. I think it's a great little game. And Spiel de Jars Award 
for those that are 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 familiar, it always is has a little bit more of that family uh, easy access gateway ish type of feel to it. But then they go to the Kenner Spiel, which is the heavier strategy game, right? Mm -hmm. And then they go to the Kinder Spiel, which is the children's type of game. Yeah. Which I think is just. It's three awards, <laughs> one for heavy games, one for easy entry level, and one for children, which is, I think is, is a really nice kind of measure of all the games in general. Um, as compared to some people that do a kind of, you know, we're going to do an award for the best uh, male miniature in game. We're going to do an award for the best female miniature in the game. We're going to do a best uh, board game with a board, best board game without a board. <laughs> do you know what I'm saying? Oops, sorry, I took off my mic. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah, no, exactly. Uh, you know, there's a lot of other awards that are out there. Uh, we know that the board game geek community is, is a very significant worldwide community, and they have the Golden Geek Awards. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, when I, when I see the Golden Geek Awards, I feel like the awards are very well vetted. Yes. It because seems like there's... A really large community that's weighing in on it. Mm -hmm. um, sometimes it might be a little bit more European, you know, centric a little bit. I don't, you know, the Spiel de Jars or the Spiel Awards, of course, are are highly European centric. They get announced there, and a lot of times in the North America, we haven't even received these games and don't even know what it is. Yeah, like the recent um, El Dorado, which uh, is Ryan Canizia. You you hadn't. Got, you still haven't got it, I don't believe. I don't think we've got Yeah, I still don't think we have okay. it. So, you know, obviously, I know Stronghold Games, Terraforming Mars, was uh, nominated in the Kender, in the Kenner Spiel. Mm -hmm. uh, but we, 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 were, we did have availability of that, but we couldn't make a judgment on the other ones. Yeah, but I with, think that, that's more of a case of the, the game is actually designed in Germany, and it was Stephen that actually bought the rights to publish it in America as well. So, uh, you know, it's kind of like a, you know, because it's published in Germany, it gets entered. If it's not been published in Germany and you can't get it in Germany, they won't enter it into to the award. It won't be considered. Yeah, exactly. And, and so, you know, the Board Game Geek Awards, the Golden Geeks, I think are a pretty good gauge of quality games. Mm -hmm. um, opinions on this this is what's so unique about this topic well I'm, I'll just go real quickly through a couple of the other ones but you know you have the dice tower awards um, personally that's one of my favorite awards uh, I like the fact that there's a large community a relatively large community I should say it like that of reviewers content creators people who generally have played a variety of of categories of games and these categories a lot of times will have seven to eight games in them and like if I'm like I've been able to vote on those if I've only played two of the eight games or something I won't make a vote in that category and so it's kind of a, a rule if you will that we all we've we've played and vetted these games to know whether or not we want to do that category and I generally have felt like they they've been really really right on with the Dice Tower Awards. Uh, the Origins Awards, uh, for years, uh, I think had some level of ambiguity within the hobby. A lot of people didn't feel like they were the greatest choices necessarily, but it's just continually gotten better and better and better. There's more people on the committee, there's more, and, and the choices and selections have been better. Uh, what else am I missing there? The Diana Jones Award? Diana Jones. For yeah, those of us who don't know what Diana Jones is. Yeah, that's some the secret cabal. Tony Topper always talks about that one every year. Yeah. And it's this really strange, obscure award that gets announced every year. Mm. Anyway. Yes. So notes. there's a lot of there's a lot of awards, right? Yeah, yeah. I mean, the, the reason this subject come up is because I watched a documentary on winemaking, and about 15 years ago, there were only five 
um, actual editors that actually produced awards for wine. And now there's like 250. So which wine is the best? You can't really, you know, if every wine gets an award because one of the 250 award givers and I've given their, their you know, a mark of approval, which one is the best? Um, yeah, and then uh, ben, ben just mentions that the Mensa Award. That's yeah. for all the brilliant people. You know, you've got yeah. <laughs> all the smart people getting on that one. Yeah, the Golden Taco I never taco voted on that award. one because <laughs> the Golden Taco, I could get in on that one. Yeah, uh, it's, <laughs> it's, I don't know, I think it's become a bit convoluted, um, even with podcasters giving awards as well. Um, I mean, oh. I mean, technically, Dice Tower was a podcaster, but it evolved and became so big that I think it does deserve the the right to 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 issue awards. Um, but the thing is, with where they have so many contributors, com <coughs> so many contributors, the contributors can give an award as well. So Z, Z might say, "Yeah, this is this is a, a great game. This is a, a Dice Tower award." Where Tom might say, "No, it's not," <laughs> but it'll still get the award because Z reviewed it and it says it's great. Um, you know, it's kind of it's, it's a bit too open. It's not like death defined. It doesn't pass through one doorway. It's passing through many doorways. So um, if a game if a game has a prestigious award. And just for sake of topic, we'll call the ones we've mentioned prestigious. Mm -hmm. Let's say the, if if a game is awarded that, like let, let's just take this, let's just take King Domino. Now that's maybe a bad example because that's probably one of the most prestigious award winners. But say that King Domino gets this award. Now, do you buy King Domino where you wouldn't have bought it before? Yeah, that's a good point. Um, normally, for me, if it has uh, an award on it from the Eschen Spiel, if it's a game that I'm interested in, I would go out and buy it because it, one, it, it's a game that I'm interested in. Two, it's been approved by this committee of experienced board gamers. What about you? Yeah, I think I think it it, it influences me. Um, I'm probably less. I'll give you a probably a better example for me personally. Um, I don't care for chaos games. Mm -hmm. The game Pit. Do you remember that? You know, and you're yelling out numbers, and yeah. you know, and, and you know, you're doing that kind of thing. Um, there was a game that was called Space Cadets and 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 Space Cadets Dice Duel. Um, I think those are really good, well designed games. So don't get me wrong. I just don't like the chaos of them. Mm -hmm. There, there's a tension and then the noise level gets so loud it's hard for me to you got to be kind of thoughtful and you can't be thoughtful you just got to quickly make a decision and I don't like that um, there's a game last year that won a pot load of the dice tower awards and it was captain sonar okay okay I haven't played it but I watched it being played um, there were eight people at the table and right away I went, I don't want to play this game. Mm. I don't care how many awards it got. <laughs> now, maybe that's an extreme example because of my bias. I don't know. Mm. But um, I've gotten to the point in my game collection and in my stage of life, which is really busy right now, that I'm, I'm very cautious about adding another game to the collection because it's going to set on the shelf of shame. Yeah. So, so the award itself is not going to do it for me generally, except you know for media content creation that we need to review things. I generally would say that I would vet the game by watching somebody review it. I would find out what what the game is first, and then the the clincher would be the award. Yeah, but not yeah. the main. Uh, again, I think. Again, I think the way that awards are are done are going to be completely different. It might be a body of people that sit together every day and go, right, these games are good ones, these ones are not. Okay, and then they narrow it down and they narrow it down. Whereas some, like the Dice Tower Awards, are done by votes and it's done by the, the a large committee of gamers like ourselves. And that, again, doesn't give a, a very, very exact... For me personally, it doesn't give an exact representation of it if a game is good or not. Like you said, Captain Sona won lots of awards uh, 
because of lots of people who had played it and they thought it was good. But if they thought it was good but not great, then then that's like 600 votes for, yeah, this game should, should go through to the next round. Whereas there this might is... be like a handful of people that have played a really great game and unfortunately it doesn't get through because only a handful of people have played it. Only a handful of that, that committee. Yeah, and I, I think popularity factors into these awards and and Definitely. you know whether or not the game is popular and and one of the things that I think maybe skews things I'm going to go over to you know BGG for instance the board game geek awards which are the golden geeks and you have also the hot games that are are and and I don't know what all the algorithms are but I've seen some really crappy games get a lot of attention on the hot games because certain people were pushing people to go there and yeah. say something. Yeah. And again, and that was not cool. Well, that wasn't indicative of it being a good game, but because it reached that status on that hot games, people assuming it's popular and thus an award then. And so all of a sudden it's not really giving us an indication of the game necessarily. Yeah. Again, it's I probably, with the hotness list after say a, a video comes out of the tech top, top 10 you know games that so and so is looking for at Essen or whatever that's when the list will adjust because th that person has a lot of esteem in the board game industry and therefore I mean I'm looking at it now and I, I saw a video today that they posted and four of the games are already shot straight up to the top of the hotness list and it's because they've said it's good and everyone's gone and clicked on it and looked at it but yeah. again, not a true representation of what is a really good game. Although I would say the seventh continent is still at the top. <laughs> <laughs> well, and that's where I think as, as consumers now, there's just such a glut and so many opportunities to, to get so many great games. And, and then there's the mediocre games and then there's the not so good games. And for us to, to have multiple reviewers, have multiple people, and sometimes that too can be just, you know, you you get some of your favorite reviewers all saying the same thing. We generally trust them. Um, mm -hmm. But it could it can be that all of them just happen to be involved in a certain project that they're all really jazzed about. And I don't know if we're always a, totally objective, but on on the other hand, you know, I went I went Godfather, I think, is a really get, great example of that. You know, I was able to experience that game in a very special way at a very special ex exposition down in Atlanta. Yeah. Well, that might have skewed my experience uh, a little bit because it was very, very positive, right? Mm -hmm. But then subsequently, I've played the game with several different people, and it's always worked great. My daughter, Gabrielle, who's not a big strategy per a gamer, she loves it. She wants to play it again right away, you know? Uh so I, I feel like I'm, I'm fairly objective there, but you know, everybody of the, a lot of the popular content creators were talking about the Godfather. Well, I wonder how many people didn't even go and review the game or didn't even really just went, Oh, Rodney likes it. <laughs> Chaz likes it. You know, Joel Eddie <laughs> likes it. Jamie from the cabal likes it. Everybody likes it. So I'm just getting it. Yeah, so um, what should we do? Should we trust an award? If a box, if a game has a, a, the box cover and it has a, a mark on it, do we trust that or do we trust the reviewer that we, we've grown up watching every time? You know, what do we need the awards if we have these reviewers who, as I said, you, you're attached to, you know, or is the award just to, to, to kind of like promote gaming in general? Yeah, I think it's a good point. You know, I, I think we'd be naive to think that these organizations that put out an award, that there are not, I mean, people being vested <laughs> at one level or not. I'm not, I'm not calling on conspiracy theory here, but... I am. <laughs> uh, <they're, Sorry. laughs> well, in some cases, it, it probably has happened. I don't know. Yeah. The, I mean, I, it does raise a question. I think yeah, Ben makes a really good point here because he's talking about a very highly rated game and it's rated 10 and, and that was during the Kickstarter. Uh, but a lot of people never even received the game. 
Mm. And so how do you know, you know, I don't know if I'm a column A, a little column B. Yeah, yeah. It's I think he's referring to board game geek and the fact yeah. that, you know, people are giving, uh, giving even a 10 out of 10 even before they've even got the game. Yeah. You know, and that generates that's the top, it. gets them up on the hotness list. Yeah, thanks for clarifying that. Yeah, now I understand. Uh, yeah, I think that's exactly right. And And, you know, the reviewing side of things, versus the award side of things. I mean, they're two different things because generally the reviewers are not voting on the awards so much. Uh, would, would you say that's accurate? Possibly. I mean, not, not in the case of the Dice, Dice Tower Awards, but when you look at the other awards, would you say that those people are, are reviewers? That I are would, making those judgments, I'd or is it other for committee Essen, members? There, there is a certain body of people, and they are, you know, journalists, and they are, you know, um, members of the, the the community of of, of board gaming of some sort. Um, and again, as I said, there are a body of people that you know get together and hold meetings and vote, and and, and at the end, they they have all played all the games that have been nominated. So then, then they can make a, a final judgment that this is definitely the winner, uh, which I think is, you know, a, a nice way of narrowing down instead of saying, right, you hundred people, tell me which one is the best game out of this lot, because you're going to get a hundred different answers. <laughs> yeah, well, I think there almost ought to be some kind of criteria uh, that that the reviewer has to have some kind of credentials, if you will, that they've done this, you know, if, it, if it's a nominated for, for the spiel, for instance, then that mm -hmm. game has to be played so many times, different yeah. player counts, all of those things. So that it's not just a, Oh yeah, I like that one really a lot. And I, I've played it three times. I played it five times and yeah, it's really great versus playing it 20 times at different player counts with different people really being objective. Yeah, yeah. I, I think the different awards, though, they all stand for different things anyway. Like the Mesna is, you know, it's been judged by a committee of very intelligent people that believe that the game, it, you know, gives some kind of lesson and is, you know, intuit not intuitive, but, um, you know, it is an intelligent, logical kind of puzzle or something like that. Whereas, say, um, the, the Gen Con awards are done by the guys that run Gen Con probably and a few other reviewers chucked in for great measure and they just decide well you know what game do you think is the best this one or this one you know it's you know the, the, there's not like um a certain control and there's no there's control because it's it's intelligent thinky logical games whereas you know other awards are different so every different award is going to have a different kind of level of you know what games are going to be qualified and nominated the Essen Spiel, as I said, is only going to be games that have been published in Germany. And again, it has to run through their board before they narrow it all down. The Dice Tower, they just ask everybody to, you know, choose a, what, what's your favorite game in this category, this category, in this category, in this category. Everyone votes. And then the highest votes get, you know, narrowed down again and narrowed down. And it gets funneled that way. So each award has its different, you know, um, channel of getting a winner and we you know we should recognize that we should recognize that it's done this way and that's done that way and that's done this way and that way we can judge for ourselves if this game is for us due to the fact that the way that the voting is done the way that the the, the award is given yeah i think you're right uh, there, there's there's a lot of a lot of thought that goes into each one um there's a lot of work and a lot of playing that's for sure <laughs> Yeah, I'd, I'd like to see the award, awards not be just a popularity contest. Yeah. And and Ben makes a comment about, you know, the Baseball Hall of Fame nominations. And you can talk about pro football nominations too. But baseball has been just such a uh, – people who should have been in there a long time ago didn't get in there. Yeah. Um, all of those kind of things. And, and we have to be really naive to not think that, you know, everybody is vying for this – nomination they're vying for this award if they get this award it's going to be a big cash day mm -hmm. for them um so i mean people put a lot of effort and energy 
excuse me, into gearing their game for that type of award. Yeah. Because if you know the Spiel des Jahres is going to net you this as a business person, well, you're going to try to make a game that fits that category. Yeah. You know, or, or potentially you could. I mean, yeah, I'm, they're, they're I'm, I'm generalizing that, haven't they? Yeah, I think so. Mm. Yeah. yeah. So let's talk well, about the awards on a box because, you know, you get boxes and sometimes they're plastered full of awards and you can't see what the game is. Um, but what, which awards draw us towards the game? For me, yeah, yeah. it's the Essence Spiel, of course. And then second up would be Spiel. the Besner. Those, those are the two wards that I, I trust. Those are the ones that I, you know, it, it, as I said, if a game interests me and it has that award on it, it's a clincher. Like uh, Alhambra, I bought a year or so ago. You know, it interested me. I watched a couple of reviews. Um, but it was the, the fact that it had that, that logo on it. I said, yeah, let's get this. My wife is going to like this. My daughter is going to like this. And they did. Yeah, I'd agree the Spiel de Jars says is probably one of the, and the Kenner Spiel, I would say too, because I love that category. Um, the Dice Tower Awards for me is one that I would I would uh, feel confident in that it's a good game. Uh, what, it might not be a great game for me personally, but I'll know that at least this is a, a, a well-designed game because if it's not a well-designed game, I guarantee you there's enough people in that group that are going to say, no, no, this doesn't deserve it, and there'll be a big fight, so... <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I think it's an interesting topic. You know, awards are definitely something that's kind of fun. We all like competition. So we like to hear the announcement. We like to see the nominees. Mm -hmm. uh, I much think like we, we like to ten top, much like we like listening to top tens and things like that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Now, I don't know if anybody listening out there, if you know, is there another award that's being announced at the Spiel? You know, we know that the Spiel de Jars has been announced. Uh, we also, you know, have the, was it Ice Cool won the? Kenner Spiel. Uh, Kinder Spiel. Kinder Spiel. The Kenner Spiel was, uh, which one won that? I know Terraforming Mars was Exit. nominated. Exit. Exit won it. That's right. But I, I thought I just saw somewhere that Terraforming Mars won some big award. Uh, is there another award at, at Essen that's being released? Not, not Worst World Book. No. We have oh. another game. <laughs> <laughs> have to ask Paul Grogan about that. Yes, we will. <laughs> Anybody know anything about that? All right. Well, I know we're, we are running out of time, so we're going to have to cut this thing short. Uh, do you have any final final uh, thoughts that you have on this, Barry? No, but if you want to, um, I've put a poll up on our Board Game Geek Guild 2248 um, called Essen Sucker. And in it, you just vote and tell me which of your, uh, which of these awards really appeals to you and, and like clinches that deal when you buy again. Go there, have a quick click, have a quick laugh. And uh, we'll, we'll announce what, what you guys think um, in our next show. Yeah, that sounds great. Uh, join us on the Board Game Geek Guild 2248, Berkey and Badger. You can also check us out on Facebook, Berkey and Badger, and on Twitter at Berkey and Badger. And you can always go and catch all of our old episodes at BoardGameTheater.com or BoardGamesEverybodyShould.com. And you'll see all of those links uh, in the show notes here. The professional audio mastered version of this show that Barry does so amazing will be up in just a couple days because he's going to work overtime to make sure it gets done before my Kickstarter's over. Yeah, so and that I will make sure that I do it before Essen starts. So, yes, it will be edited by then. Yes. Okay. So, thanks very much for <laughs> watching, Chaps, Chapits. Sorry, Babalites. I'm going to get it right. The Babalites, yes. yes. <laughs> Join us on our next show. We don't know when and we don't know where, but we're sure we'll meet again some sunny day. <laughs> 
We're so glad we had this time together. We certainly are. Let's yeah. play. <laughs> Thanks so much, everyone. Take care. We're so glad we had this time together. You know it's time to go. It won't be long until we have another show. So keep us in mind. Get online. Berkey and Badger will be back in no, no time.